Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. It's a Monday heading up to Thanksgiving, and I'm glad to be with you. If you want to jump into the best conversation and talk journalism, it's right here at 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. Emails go to talk at LarsLarson.com. Well, the coronavirus antibody treatment given to President Trump last month, and I guess more recently to uh, Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson, who was quite ill, unlike President Trump, uh, that treatment is soon going to become available to the general public. And I thought we'd ask uh, Dr. Kevin Pham, who's a visiting policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation, but more importantly, he is a medical doctor, about Regeneron and the 300,000 doses of this newly authorized antibody treatment that are going to be available by early January. Dr. Pham, welcome back to the program. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. So why wasn't this approved a, a long time ago, or, or have we only just recently known that this was worthwhile as a treatment? I mean, the president got it a month ago. Right. So you would think that after the president got it, then we would consider it good enough for your average American. But these things take uh, <clears throat> they take a little bit of time to gather all the data, uh, to organize the data and present it such that uh, it meets all the statutory requirements of an emergency use authorization. These things in- include... Um, preliminary results and um, an argument for uh, the application of an, of an emergency use authorization. So a lot of bureaucratic mess. You'd think that we'd be able to get through it for COVID-19, but um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's probably harder to, reco- to recover from bureaucracy than it is to recover from COVID-19. You know, somebody gave me the example the other day and said uh, that in the case of Ebola, remember when he had the Ebola outbreak and we were concerned about it getting in here, they began working on a, a vaccine of some kind, and uh, and they said that the total time to get it approved was somewhere around five years. So people should realize that the fact that we now have three vaccines coming out against COVID-19 in less than a year is stratospherically fast for uh, for the American system. Does that suggest that our government regulatory system is is too hidebound, that is too narrow minded and that is trying to be too careful? Um, In the case of the vaccines, I don't believe that that's a, a, a very strong argument. The reason why this is going so fast is because the government is, is dumping a lot of money into the, into the vaccines. And the government is paying for these vaccines before they're even proven to work. So they're taking away a lot of the business risk. And so this isn't, uh, this isn't much a matter of bureaucratic um, burdens holding back the vaccines, but it's more of a matter of the government underwriting the risk so that uh, the, gov- the businesses can just go on at full speed. Okay, but but I mean, the actual lab work that created the vaccine, that may have been sped up somewhat by the money. But am I still am I incorrect that it, it, it's not being held up? Because even now, uh, we don't we uh, unless it's happened in the last little bit, we still don't have emergency youth use authorization for the uh, the Pfizer vaccine or the uh, or the Moderna vaccine. So. You know, once the, the private company has run all of the tests that it's required to run, the you know, thousands of people who get tested on the vaccine, what is it that takes all the time? All right. With regards to that, then, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Right now, the the vaccines are essentially proven. Moderna has to wait a few um, a few more weeks to get the, the follow up time in order to make sure everyone is everyone is safe in the, the vaccine trial. But the Pfizer vaccine that's in there has been pretty, and we're basically waiting. And they applied for the emergency use authorization last Friday, and we're just waiting for the the FDA to to convene on December 10th, which is two and a half weeks away. So I don't I don't know why they're not moving heaven and earth to get their meeting going. Uh, part of it is they have to they have to uh, validate all the data and then confirm that it that it meets all the requirements. But I feel like they'd be able to, if they put their heads to it, um, they, they, they should be able to get an emergency use authorization for something as important as this a lot quicker. But, yeah, it, bureaucracy is very difficult to get through. Well, see, Dr. Pham, that seems to be an example. Is, is this, this meeting on, you know, in early December, is that just the regular meeting of that board that they hold once a month or so or once a quarter or so? So, in other words, if you really have something where it's an all-hands-on-deck situation, wouldn't you say, wouldn't you think that a, 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 a body like that that's going to hold a meeting says our regular meeting is in early January, but you know what? This is important enough. Why don't we all get together on a teleconference or a Zoom uh, and, and let's make the decision right now and get the process underway? It's almost as though, if I'm right, that that's their regular meeting. They say, oh, yeah, we'll wait for it to come up in our regular meeting. What's an extra two or three weeks? No big deal, right? 
uh, I, I, I would agree with you in this case. Um, now, to be fair to the FDA, they, they do have to, to, to validate the data, and there's going to be a lot of it. Um, but I don't – but, yeah, there's, there's no reason why they can't just get a whole bunch of people together in a room and start, start crunching through all that data right away and, and get this out as soon as possible. I, I don't see why this has to be on December 10th. If you can schedule it, then you're probably not going fast enough. I mean, assuming that this stuff really is, the two vaccines are said to be about 95 percent uh, effective, uh, one with two doses, and the other, which I think are a month apart. The other one, I, as I understand it, with one dose, uh, the better vaccine, that, or it seems to be better in that it doesn't have to be frozen down to less than 100, deg- or 100 degrees below zero and transported in a special way and all that, that you'd say, if we could start giving those doses out two weeks sooner, you know, to a group of people who are right on the front lines who may be the ones most likely to end up getting it because they're caring for for patients who may be sick already, you literally could be costing some people their lives by waiting an extra two weeks, couldn't you? You, you I mean, you, you basically can. I mean, every single day we're losing um, hundreds at this point. Uh, I forget what the daily daily mortality is, but it, it's very high. It, it's, it's starting to rise up again after... Um, after a pretty long period of plateau. So every day that we lose is a day that we're going to lose more people. So Doc, tell me this, do you have an inkling as to why we're seeing this massive spike and not just in one area or one region of the country, but we're seeing it in a number of different areas. Is there a reason it's happening now? I mean, if this was the traditional seasonal flu, we know it kind of goes down in the warmer winter months or summer months, and then it comes back up in the winter months. But is, does anybody have an idea as to why we're seeing a spike right now? We're not even next to, say, uh, Labor Day or some other period of time where you'd expect to have big get- get-togethers. In fact, we're about to hit the, what we all refer to as the holiday season, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and those times. If, if, if it's bad without any, and, and I guess unless you want to blame it on Halloween, do, you have any, do the doctors have any idea why it's spiking now? Uh, it, it probably is just people uh, getting fatigued with all these um, all these mitigation measures, and and there's there's been a lot of um, double standards with how these uh, measures, these rules, these regulations, how they're applied. We see um, people who are trying to go to church they get harassed, and people who are going out to protest get you know applauded by by everybody, including including those in in policy making. So people are seeing that, and they're seeing this. Um, uh, uneven application of the rules, and they're just going to start disregard, disregarding and not cooperating with these rules that help uh, prevent uh, disease transmission. So, you know, you get you, you're going to start getting breakdown when people when they see that the rules don't apply to them. You're going to start getting um, breakdown in the the best practices and the precautions. And as to that, then the uh, people are, are starting to gather together more more just because we're going into the holiday seasons. Uh, yeah, those two things put together, it really is really going to cause um, the lax measures. Really going to cause an increased transmission in this virus. You know, Doc, it all, it's almost like we've got to talk to psychologists because you know the old adage: "Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me." For you know, for getting fooled the second time. Uh, I think a lot of Americans may be looking at this, saying, "Okay, we bought your nonsense six or eight months ago when you started telling us you have to do this and you have to do that, and we bought into it." And then it didn't seem to make a gigantic difference. And, and now you're telling us, now we've got to double down on it. I got fooled the first time. I'm not getting fooled the second time. In some ways, I almost think that people have a stronger uh, resistance to being told what to do the second time around because of what they perceived as what happened the first time around. Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. The, the amount of panic that's being applied to COVID-19 has been essentially constant since about May uh, people have been in a five alarm state since then, or at least the people who are making the rules have been in a five alarm state since then. But there's no, and there's no recognition from them that a case back in March is different from a case today. We have so many new treatment options today that your risk of death from getting the virus, you know, it's it's not zero, and for some groups it's still very high. But for most of most Americans, anyone under the age of 49, um, your risk of death is very very low. So we shouldn't be acting as if. And, and people, ordinary people see this. We shouldn't be acting as if this is going to be a death sentence for anyone who gets it. And because, the, because of the mismatch in, in perceived risk and the, the five-alarm state that I've been talking about, because of that mismatch, then people are just not taking it seriously because 
they know that the people who are making the rules aren't taking it seriously either. Maybe the people making the policies haven't heard the story about the little boy who cried wolf, huh? <laughs> probably not. Yeah, probably not. Doctor, it's always a pleasure to have you on the program, and I hope this Regeneron really does help some people out there. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the program. I appreciate it. Sure thing. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. That's Dr. Kevin Pham, who's a policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation, but most importantly, he's a medical doctor. Now, I do anything to protect my loved ones, and so did one off-duty cop in Virginia, should he face charges for allegedly protecting his family from a man with a knife. We'll get to that and your phone calls at 866-439-5277. 